welcome to the 495 Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Sparks, Editor-in-Chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. I have to apologize for missing last week's episode. <laughs> I was in the uh, I was in urgent care down in Western Massachusetts, uh, and I've been uh, at the tail end of this horrible, horrible year with all sorts of illnesses and problems. I had pneumonia. I had the flu. I probably had things they didn't even diagnose me with. As we talked, you're a dad now. I know. These things are going to happen. I caught this from the baby who who smiled through the whole thing. The baby had never (laughs) been sick. The baby had not been sick in her whole life, went an entire year, then caught this, and the dominoes began to fall, and staying up late in the hospital, and not sleeping enough, and, and looking after a baby and a toddler. When you're not feeling well, Mm-hmm. is a challenge that I just, I, I was not, they didn't prepare me for that one in particular because you still have to fight to get them to sleep and then finally one of them goes to sleep and you finally, you know, you lie down, you have your cup of yeah. Tulsi tea, you're going to relax and then you hear crying from the other room and the whole thing starts again. Yeah, mine are 24 and 20. I've been through it, so I'm yeah. just smiling because I, I know what you're going okay. through. Okay, <laughs> I, I appreciate the sympathy. <laughs> There's it's too little of that in the world. Yeah. So uh, let's start with Ask the Editor. And one thing I want to say about Ask the Editor, first of all, if anybody has any questions, editor at mvmag.net, you can write to me. Uh, I got a lot of questions this past week, so we have a backlog. And some of them don't have to do with editing. They have. I've written a lot about food, so people tend to ask me food advice and all sorts of weird things. We're going to stick to to a kind of classic editing question this week. But don't be afraid to ask me about the sort of things we've written about or the process, anything having to do with yeah. – um, uh, you'll, you'll see. You'll see over time that there will be some questions that seem off the wall, and you'll begin to understand why that's the case. Tracy asked this question, and I love this question because I'm a writer, mm-hmm. and I have no intention or don't want or will stay as far away as possible from being an editor as I can because I'm not a technically strong writer. That's what you guys do. Yeah. So this question fascinates me. Because as a writer, I let all this go. As an editor, she asks, since becoming an editor, do you find it more difficult to write freely without overthinking and editing as you go? Has your writing style changed because of your job experience? So, um, so yeah, there, there's, there's a lot here. I would say there was, a, there was a time early on when I was doing this full time, right, when I, like the first year, when I began to feel sort of crippled by the experience and it took me so long yeah. to because i write the captions i write the titles to a lot of things in the stories and it just i was overthinking everything having to do with the magazine and it's because i had the copy editor on one shoulder i mean it was i i had well, a, because you have the title yeah. as a writer i sit there and i write and i go well that's for the editor yeah right you know? yeah and, <laughs> i just and write I and put it out sort and of have let to it go. do everything yeah. and there's you know i had an old friend in grad school who used to say you can't write as though you have a Protestant minister sitting on your shoulder. <laughs> and, and if you're censoring and you're kind of holding back all the time, it just it creates the worst conditions for achieving these kind of flow states. Like we talk about flow states, like if you're good at your, what you're yeah. doing, right? It just kind of flows. It seems to flow effortlessly out of you. Now, to get to those flow states takes a lot of practice. Yes. It takes a lot of work, et cetera, et cetera. So the way I dealt with this is I just tried to be as, as, as I just tried to have fun with it, and it sounds so simple. It's easy, right? Just have fun with it, right? <laughs> but I, I would just write. I would turn off the editor side, and I would sit down and write, and I did not care if it was good. I didn't care if it was bad. I didn't care about the punctuation. I didn't care about the spelling. If I didn't know a date, I would write XXX, and I would go back and figure that out. I right. didn't want anything to interrupt this feeling of just letting it kind of flow out of me. And, and then I was able to get past this sort of initial period. Yeah. Okay, so as far as the process, and I, and I tell people this all the time, I tell interns this when they come in, because their writing can actually really suffer once they start coming in to, to publish and they have deadlines, because they're, they're now kind of crippled by this experience, and they're worried, and they realize that all these things they're doing wrong, yeah. that they didn't notice, they didn't realize were wrong, for, not really wrong, it's just to get to a certain professional right. level, it has to look a certain way, etc. So I always tell them, don't worry, just write. Just have fun with it, write it, and now the editor comes in. Yeah. In the editing part, which some people are, are daunted by, <laughs> but to me, in some ways, this this has its own pleasures, 
right? Because the uh, because the writer sort of throws the clay down. It's sort of, okay, this is going to be a horse. We're going to make a horse, all right? And now the editor comes in. It's fine-tuning. And now it has to look right. It has to have some motion. It has to have some flow and some logic. And you have to make sure the details are right, right? So then this, this second side of you gets to come in with its, its, its just completely different mindset. And which is also really neat, right? Because there's a pu- there's a fact finding aspect to it, there's a puzzle making aspect to it. Uh, so I enjoy these these two parts of the process. So that's how you deal you deal it. Yeah. Deal with it with alter ego. Yeah. Be the exactly. writer first, you, you, be the editor you, after. You split yeah. your brain for sure. Now the second part of this question is: Does it change my sort of day to day writing style? Uh, a journalistic or a you know the sort of what we do is is very compressed. We try to avoid any sort of uh, repetition. So without, without question, my writing style has become more minimal and more refined in that way. It's not good or bad. Well, what's the old saying? Cut till it hurts? Cut, exactly. Yeah, now, you there's, do it while you're writing. Sure. Now, yeah. there are lots of great writers who don't do this. It doesn't mean it's good writing. It just means that's what I do. So I get used to this, this sort of real minimal, clear, clean style that's yep. detail-driven. And yet, at the same time, I don't want to lose that side of me that appreciates the music of language and the joys of the way. Th- you know, so I like to also make sure there's the somebody else comes in in my own head and makes sure that it, it sounds right and it's playful right. and it's fun and it's engaging in a way. So it's not just dry information because we're not a newspaper. And to do a songwriter analogy, it's got to have hooks. It's got to have the hooks. And you got to hear the hooks repeatedly. You got to get sure. a lot of hooks. Yeah. 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 So and it does. I mean, it, it does sort of affect uh, you know my emails. I know for sure there was a period of time where I hated writing emails because I was so self conscious. And then you also you you, you don't want to be too self conscious wow, about and any emails? of this because yeah. <laughs> what what happen is other people will shut down because mm-hmm. they start thinking, oh, you're a grammar guy, and then they become self conscious. Yeah. So part of it is just okay. Throw your cliches in there. Uh, don't cut out every adverb. Uh, definitely don't correct people's grammar because then it's it's no fun for anybody. Well, we all and nobody's going to want to talk to you. We're all involved with the grammar police. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. and everything. So it, it, it wears on often, people. Yeah, yeah, who very often aren't even talking about grammar. They're talking right. about usage. And, yeah. and other sorts of issues. Yep. Uh, so that's the way. I yep. mean, it's a great question. It uh, is a great it's, question. Uh, um, and so that's the way I, I handle it. So today on the podcast, we have Dan Gravick who is the president of the Board of Directors of the Watershed Council. Uh, and we're going to get into some of the work he's doing. And a neighbor I didn't know till today. Yeah. yeah. He's your neighbor out yeah. in your report. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you sort of want an interesting introduction to him that goes beyond the sort of details, he's a fantastic photographer. What's your, your Instagram name? Dandy Danny G. Danny Danny G on Instagram. So go check him out and follow him on Instagram because what you're going to see, this this is the sort of thing where I, you must get this question of like, oh, what a life you lead because it makes <laughs> right. it seem like you're just spending all day like chasing like owls, right. snowy owls, because <laughs> right. that's what's on Instagram, right? Well, that's the perception of social media, right? You can yeah. create a whole alternative life that people don't realize you actually have a job, yes. responsibilities, and this is just a hobby that I love yeah. to do. Yeah, and you're, you're an insurance, so you have a legit... Yeah, I, I run sales for a small health and digital well-being platform, yeah. and yeah, so we sell to large employers and help them with their benefits. Yeah, but you're so going back to the photography, you're getting rare birds. I'm seeing things on your Instagram. I, I'm a nature guy. I love mm-hmm. going out and hiking, but I have I have not seen some of the things that you see all the time, or what seems to be all the time. Yeah. Uh, what's that process like? Yeah, it's patience and persistence and knowledge. And I live on Plum Island, so I'm lucky mm. that that's a migratory um, route for a yeah. lot of birds that come through. So the snowy owls right now are what people are chasing. Yeah. And we've got three, four, five of them hanging out on the island. But sometimes it takes a six mile walk on the beach in freezing cold weather, and you might not see anything. Mm. Uh, last week I walked, uh, the road was closed to the end of the island. And I spent a lot of time walking the beach found an owl, I'm taking some pictures, which I thought were going to be really great. But the high tide was up, so I didn't want to get too close to this bird because it was on the dune. And you don't want to scare them. It's where they're eating their food, they're resting, they're doing their thing. So I stayed as close to the water line as I could. Got the tripod set up, I'm taking pictures, the snowy's looking at me. Wasn't looking behind me and the waves come over, swamp my boots. Uh. It was a day where we had four degree wind chill. Mm. I had to walk two miles back with sopping wet boots. I'm sure the snowy was just laughing at me. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's what it takes. It takes patience and you need to be out there. Um, I'm up at sunrise every morning um, on the island. And if I don't find a bird, the sunrises on Plum Island are just out of this world. What what drives that? I, I feel like, because like, I, I actually did an article on duck hunting a couple mm-hmm. years ago. 
And some of those guys, even though they looked like, I guess, rednecks, you might say, yeah. they worked for Raytheon. Mm -hmm. Some of them. They were engineers. They were, they were, but they would still get up very early every day because they had this bug. Is there like a photography bug that's just like, I don't care if I have the, I don't care if I have pneumonia today. I need to, and especially with these, you know, like rare birds, yeah. do you, is it almost like a hunting impulse? It's sort of like a FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Yeah. There's the short-eared owls that are hunting in the morning and you got to get there between such and such a time because every other photographer is going to get it. Or a rare bird, a warbler comes through in the spring and everyone's buzzing about it and you've got to see it because it's only going to be there for a day. So there is that sort of, I think it's the fear of missing out, hmm. but it's also the hunt. It's yeah. the chase. It's the finding it. Um, it's Do you ever put yourself in danger, or are you more sort of meditative? Like, in other more words, are you sort of, okay, so you're yeah. not like, I'm going to go hang off this ledge <laughs> no. and risk being attacked by the, you know, the African honeybee. Not yet. Uh, we don't have anything that dangerous okay. around here. I think if I had the chance, maybe, because right. I'm a little bit risk-taking, okay. but uh, not put my life in danger. But I will go out on my kayak, and I'll get into places that are tough with the currents, mm. um, or do it when the water's really cold. And so there's an element of risk and danger there, but nothing too extreme. How much of the photographs are shot from your boat versus? Small percentage, 5%. Oh, really? Yeah, most are on okay. foot or from the car or walking, hiking. I've only seen you in person doing it from the boat. So I have this <laughs> image always of you out there, you right? know, with the, with the gear. Yeah. yeah. It's a little tough in the winter time to be on the kayak yeah. with the I, ice. And... So uh, you grew up in kind of different places. You were born in Eden. New York, New York right? yeah, outside of Buffalo. Uh, outside of Buffalo, but you've moved a lot. You went to high school in Rhode Island for a time. Correct. Uh, you went to college out in the Midwest. You went to uh, University of Michigan. Michigan for graduate school. Undergrad was um, Rochester, New York. So okay. Midwest for both of them. So you've moved a lot. A bunch, yeah. So, so where does the kayaking come into this maybe semi-nomadic uh, young <laughs> lifestyle? Um, I think the kayaking is just getting in touch with nature and being able to fish. Mm. Um, I grew up outside of Buffalo where we had salmon that were stocked in the lakes and they'd run up the rivers and my uncle and dad would take me as a young kid and we'd fish and have a great time. Yeah. Uh, so I learned- Do you still fish? I do, okay. almost every day in the summer. All right. Uh, just bought a real boat instead of the kayak, right. so I've got to have two to fish with. Don't, don't be afraid to share. No, fish no, with no. The, uh, the Merrimack Valley Magazine <laughs> offices. You guys are welcome to. Well, it's a little salmon jerky sounds right. Like. Striped bass. <laughs> All right. right. So, yeah, yeah. so I think that got me in touch with nature. And as I moved from place to place, uh, you know, I really settled in New England back '85. Landed in New England, hmm. and it's really been anchor and home since then. Going to high school, we had a boat. My mom and stepdad sailed quite a bit. They actually lived on a boat for several years, going back and forth between Rhode Island and the Caribbean. So I've always been on the water. I've been hiking. I did Patagonia last year for 17 days and wow. backpacked in. And so I've so always you're loved like the living in a tent? Yeah, in a tent. It was nine days of tent. You carry all your food in, you filter water. And uh, Did you bring your camera? Not my big one, but I did bring a camera. Okay. So I've got a bunch of pictures on Instagram right. of that. And you're, uh, what do you do with the photography mostly, other than Instagram? Yeah, Instagram, Facebook. That's I it. do sell occasionally. Um, I've been getting requests to do shows, the okay. local coffee shops and stuff. Hey, would you want to set something up? And yeah. So I may do more of that because I really do like sharing it. Yeah. And I love. I don't care about the money aspect. Of it. I think it's really hard to make money as a photographer. Sure. But just the ability to share the things I'm seeing for people who can't get out there or don't have the ability or don't want to, but they love the pictures. I yeah. love to share that. Yeah. So you, you, the other hobby that's maybe not as clear from Instagram is you're a wine guy. I am, Well, I wasn't always a wine guy. I mean, I've always enjoyed good wine and food. But as part of my day job working in the health benefits field, I was on the road quite a bit presenting at these national conferences, talking about private health care exchanges and innovative things we're doing with benefits. And out of the blue, a guy who had facilitated a bunch of these conferences calls me and says, hey, I've got an opportunity for you. I've been friends with a producer of documentaries in Spain. They're doing a wine documentary. They're looking for a host. And they're going to go around different regions of Spain and film this wine documentary. And I said, well, if I know anyone, I'll think about it and give you some thought. He said, no, 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 we're talking about you. Hmm. I'm like, but I'm not a wine expert, and I've never been on TV. Yeah. They said, perfect, that's what they want. They, this is a documentary. They yeah. want someone who could be good on camera, ask good questions, be adventurous both from a physical aspect, but also eating different foods, trying hmm. different beverages. And I'm like, um, uh, okay, I'll talk to them. Yeah. And we did. I had a couple interviews, um, you know, sort of FaceTime interviews with the producers. They yep. liked me, I guess. And they said, all right, you're in. So like three weeks later, I was on a plane to Spain. We filmed our first episode. Okay. Um, fast forward, we've done six episodes. They were trying to sell the um, documentary to the States. But the whole premise is me and someone can, close can to me. Can people see this anywhere? Can they see a trailer for it? Is the it on trailer YouTube? is on um, the website. It's on ilovewine.online. 
Okay. I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, the trailer's out there. The information about the show is out there. They're hoping to get it sold. Uh, if season two takes off, we'll go to France or Portugal or the, the world's wide open for yeah, wine, yeah. right? Right, right. And it's not just the wine. It's also we cook with Michelin star chefs. We dig truffles. I go on um, paragliding. I've mm. done all kinds of adventurous wow. stuff, lobster boats, cycling teams. I've been to the bottom of a coal mine. Okay. You know, held a bag of dynamite, which I never thought I would do. Yeah. Um, so it's a, been a really cool experience. But Wait, through what, that, what, so why did you hold a, a bag of cause dynamite? Because they used dynamite to open up the coal mine, okay. right? And all they right. showed me where the safe was, and they, they wanted said, me to hold Here, hold yeah, this. Yeah, you can hold this like, bag of dynamite. Sure, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, is it safe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nothing hooked up <laughs> to it yet. It's safe. Yeah. Quote, unquote. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but through it, I've learned a lot about wine. And mm -hmm. I think I've gotten pretty good at understanding it. And what's interesting, though, and this is the whole film process, I knew nothing about documentaries and how it's produced and all that. So we're filming our last one of our last episodes, well, that's going to be the first episode that's going to air. Mm -hmm. So I had to play really stupid. Yeah. Right? I've learned a whole lot through this process. I had to act like I didn't know some of the answers to questions or ask questions that I already knew. So that part was fascinating to me. Sure. Yeah, this happens a lot. So so speak, the, the go to you because part of it is you're an adventure guy. Yeah. You've done triathlons. You used to coach some of the, like, mm -hmm. was it uh, Christina Minacucci from the, the Voyagers? She yeah. knew you because you were her, her triathlon coach. Yeah, and point, marathon right? coach. Yeah, she okay. ran the Boston Marathon several times, and okay. I coached her through that. I um, So how did how'd you get involved with that? Um, believe it or not, I hated running. So okay. I said, I want to Oh, I can believe it. Look at, me, look, at, look at me. I can believe that. That is not a shock to me whatsoever, <laughs> that someone would hate running. I just didn't get it. I've always been athletic. I've done all kinds of sports. But running, I was like... Anytime a team sport where the coach is like, go run, got to run, got to run, yeah. right? Do the mile in high school at the best time. You, I hated it. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, how are these people out there smiling? They're running marathons. I'm like, that's it. I'm going to sign up for a marathon. Wow. So the first run I did when was, was this? 2005. Okay. The first run, I did it with a team in training. It was a charity group for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. They had a coach. You raise money for them, and they provide a training schedule. I'm like, that'll be supported. I'll have a team. First run, we do a run around Lake uh, Quantapawit in Wakefield. Three miles. No problem. I go out of the gate, mile into it, I'm crawling. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> walking past me, flying past me. I get done with it, but I've got this competitive nature. I'm like, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to figure this out. Fast forward, I do three, four, five marathons with them. They asked me if I'd like to be a mentor because I seem to engage well with other athletes. Hmm. They then asked me to be a coach. They train me. I then say, well, marathons are boring. Let's sign up for some triathlons. And sprint triathlons become... Olympic distance, those become half Ironman, that wow. becomes an Ironman. Yeah. And I was always pretty good, I think, at coaching and teaching people. I was a teacher at one point in my career. And so being able to give what that What did you back, teach? I taught elementary school, a hmm. um, enrichment program at the Wheeler School in Providence. Okay. And so I've always had that part of me that sure. I'd like to educate, teach, mentor. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to start coaching. So I got certified. Not, I was three certifications for running, and then I went and got the USAT triathlon coaching cert. Started my own company. I was coaching at 1.80 individuals. Life got in the way in terms of financials. Had to go back to the real world, but coached for a while after that. Mm. And then I got bored with Ironman, so I did ultra marathons. I got up to the 50 mile run. Wow. A little short, little jog in the woods. Yeah. Um, what did you learn from that experience? Were you, were you careful of everything, diet, every, every little thing? Do you have to get so precise about your, your regimen at that point? Yeah, if you're going to compete, you do. And you, what did you discover? If, if, someone, if someone's going to do something like that, what do they have to eat? What's their, what's their life going to be like yeah, as they get ready? They've got to be consistent and follow a plan. right? There's, for there's, every coach, there's a different training plan, hmm. and they all can work. So you've got to stick with a plan, follow it, and then figure out what works for your body. There are certain science formulas that work. You need X amount of carbs per hour of exercise and X amount of milligrams of sodium. And so there's some guidelines you want to stay within, but then there's a lot of different ways to get there, yeah. right? For the products when you're running long distance, there's gummies, there's chews, there's waffles, there's goos, there's natural things, there's salt tablets, there's Gatorade, there's 17,000 different sports drinks. So you've got to figure out what works for your body because those long distance endurance sports can really play, wreak havoc on your intestinal system. Yeah. And any runner that's done a marathon or longer has experienced that point when you're in a long run and all of a sudden it's like, oh no. And those are typically nutritional issues that cause some distress in your uh -huh. intestines and it's all not right. so much fun. Yeah. So you, you figure that out along the way and then once you figure out what works, you stick with that routine. Um, so the consistency is important. And then if you wanna get really fast and you wanna get better, it's watch your sleep reduce your stress, follow your training plan. 80% of your uh, endurance runs, 
should be at a moderate pace. Most people train too hard. And there's this theory that the slower you run in your long runs, the faster you're going to race. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of developing economic efficiency within your um, body. Yeah. Do you make New Year's resolutions? Sometimes. Did you make one this year? This year is about balance. It oh. was, um, I had gotten, my dad passed away back in the summer, which I think mm -hmm. you knew. You're right. And so I'd gotten lazy. I gained a little weight. I hadn't been consistent with my exercise. And I've mm -hmm. always been sort of all in or all out. Right. And so my New Year's resolution was be 80%, right? on the healthy side, hmm. balance around alcohol, around the kinds of foods I eat, the exercise. I don't have to do an Ironman to stay healthy. Right. I don't have to be a teetotaler to be healthy. I can have that bowl of pasta when I'm not training and it's okay. But if I can do 80% healthy and the 20% bad, and it's been working, I've dropped a little weight, yeah. I'm feeling better physically. You so. feel good. Are, yeah. there, are there any sort of um, fitness goals you have for 20? Are you gonna do anything? Are you gonna be running any of these, these uh, crazy races? Or is, is Not, it a balance yeah. here? I, I'm signed up for the Paris Marathon, but my training hasn't, and that's April. Okay. My training hasn't gotten to where I feel like I could run it competently. So the, the transit strike might throw. Yeah, that's still going, still going on. Still going on. I know. Yeah, a yeah. friend of mine just got back from there, and she said it was really impactful in terms of getting around. Yeah. Um, they just couldn't navigate as easily. Right. Okay. Very cool. So this is this is a little bit about who you are and why you're here today. Is you're involved with the Watershed Council. Yeah. Uh, what's the Watershed Council to someone who may not have heard of it before? Yeah, so the Watershed Council has been around for about 40 years. It was formed to really take care of the Merrimack River, be an advocate for cleaning it up, for the health of it, to help with economic development, access, education. And we've gone through sort of highs and lows along the way. Really, the Clean Water Act back in the 70s really was an impetus for us to, to what be did started. That, what did, for people who don't know, what did that Water Act do? Yeah, it put regulations around what could be dumped into the river. Um, so there's these wastewater treatment plants up and down almost every major waterway in the United States. And there's these old systems that were combined with storm runoff. So when it rains really heavy, all the stuff that goes from your gutter down to the street, it goes into pipes and the sewer pipes. In the old days, they combined that with sewage, which comes from homes and businesses, right? It's human waste or whatever. So those systems were combined. Well, what happens is when there's too much rain, it overwhelms the system and they've got to dump that raw sewage somewhere to accommodate the extra overflow. Right. So they dump it into these waterways. So part of the regulations that were put in place by the EPA and the Clean Water Act was to, over time, to fix those problems. And a lot of communities have, but there's still 800 across the U.S. that haven't. So when we get a major rainstorm here in the Merrimack Valley, there are five plants up and down the river from Nashua, Manchester, Lowell, Haverhill, Lawrence that routinely dump raw yeah, sewage this, the river. this just happened, right? I'm surprised yeah. it happens in the winter. Two days I ago. I think of, of snow and, and two yeah. was it two days ago? Two so days what happened? Ago. Yeah, so you know? if, if it's, the snow isn't too bad because snow melts slowly, right? And that doesn't overwhelm a system. But when you get a half an inch, an inch, two inches of rain and a very short amount of time, it's just too much for the systems to handle. And that's what happened on Saturday night, okay. right? Well, I guess that's four or five days ago. But Saturday night, there was enough rain that it overwhelmed three systems locally. Now, there were requirements have been increased around reporting when an, issue, when an incident happens. In the past, the sewage treatment plants didn't have to tell you anything. They could say, nope, can't tell you whether sewage was released or not. Some of them started doing it voluntarily, which was nice because they want to let the public know it might not be safe to swim in the river that day or let your dog swim or eat the fish out of it. The EPA has been increasingly requiring, and it just this the last permits that the plants got, they have to notify the public when there is a release. Now, they don't have to tell how much, how long the duration went on, it's just notify them that there was an incident. We're pushing for legislation and there's a bill that Linda Dean Campbell has in front of the, the State House that says notification has to happen within two hours, you have to tell how many, um, what the volume was, the duration, did it last for three hours, 12 hours, 18 hours? You know, ultimately, there's two things that I think have to happen. One, testing. Right? It's nice to know that something's been dumped into the river, mm. but it may not have a health impact. Right, If the river's flowing really high from spring runoff and all that, and the, the volume's high and it's flowing fast, and small amount is dumped in, it can dilute it. It's still not great, but it can dilute it pretty quickly. So by the time something from Manchester gets down to Newburyport, it could be completely diluted and have no health or environmental impact. On the other hand, if the water's low and it's a huge storm and all five plants dump, then it could be really impactful. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like to see at the Watershed Council, and we're putting proposals out for this, is there's some new technology that can actually test within two hours the bacteria levels in the river. So at popular access points, we'd love to have these devices set up. They remotely 
will transmit the data and say, okay, bacteria was discovered, it's at this level, it's over safe levels. Then at least you can warn the public. What, needs, what needs to happen for these this um, funding? Yeah, the proposal we have is about a $700,000 proposal mm -hmm. that would put 12 um, testing stations all the way up and down the river. And um, they, they'd be fantastic. Now, that's not the ultimate goal, right? The ultimate goal is to stop. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, th this is actually a question I, I had for you because I, I see the debates on Facebook. Yeah, sure. Because every time somebody learns that sewage is getting dumped in the Merrimack yep. River, there's this outrage. Yes. It's like, why, why is this happening? This is nuts. Right. And, and why can't we just fix it like this? <laughs> right. What's, why, why can't we just, you know, poke, uh, it, hit the right politicians with the right cattle prods <laughs> right. To, make this, uh, to make this go away? Yeah, so there's two issues around getting it fixed quickly. One is funding, right? It's hundreds of millions of dollars to address the five plants on the Merrimack River, right? So um, that's a lot of money for these communities to, to bear. If you go to the city of Lawrence and say, hey, you need $200 million, are they going to raise taxes? and take money out of people who are figuring out how to get clothes for their kids or put a meal on their plate, that's a tough one. So there needs to be funding, so that's number one. And we can talk about where that could potentially come from. Mm -hmm. Number two, let's say they have all the funding, it could be a 15 or 20 year process to actually engineer and put the fix into place because they've got to separate all the sewage pipes that are under the city. I'll give you that for instance, Manchester's working on that right now. They've done half of the city and they've reduced their CSOs by quite a bit. They just got funding for $200 million. I believe they increased their taxes in Manchester that over the next 20 years, they'll bring in enough money to fix it. So they're solving their problem with local initiatives. To really solve it, though, to get the big money that some of these cities need, it's got to be a federal effort by our elected officials. Okay. And what does that take? So we're seeing effort. We're seeing effort by, every, I would say, every elected official up and down the river is aware of this. Mm -hmm. It's the most attention we've had on it in the past, gosh, I would even say 20 years. And so I'll give an example. Uh, Congresswoman Trahan just two days ago wrote a letter to the head of the EPA, Andrew Wheeler, imploring him to include $500 million in his fiscal 2021 budget to address the CSO problems. Now, that's great, but it's a $500 million national fund that 800 plants across the country are going to want to tap into. Mm -hmm. We need that kind of money here. So I, while I'm excited about the efforts, it's got to be more more money locally directed. Yeah. But it's a step in the right direction. Um, all of our local elected officials are engaged. So Senator DeZoglio is putting a flagging bill in place. She's formed a Merrimack River District Commission to pull together stakeholders up and down the river to really address the solutions, right? How do we fix, we all know the problem, right? And it's not just the CSOs. We're talking right now about sewage. There's also these forever chemicals that get dumped into the river. Yeah, what is that? So there's these things called PFAS. And if you ask me to tell you exactly what that means, I'm going to stumble really, but it's like sure. polyfluoro. They're basically Did chemicals. Did you watch the Netflix documentary on on PFAS? I haven't yet. You haven't, um, but you must have heard about it. I that. have, of course. And it, so for the people that's, who don't that's know. That's where I first So that's your reference point, right? My guess is some people are going to to know about this through these these kind of horrifying images of cattle that have gone blind. So there's that one. There's right. Dark Waters that just came out. And then we just had the screening of the Merrimack the Troubled Waters from the Merrimack um, River right. documentary. Yeah, that was in uh, Chelmsford. It was in Chelmsford, and it's going to be available on YouTube at some point. But So PFAS are these chemicals that are used in firefighting foam. They're used in Teflon. They're used in anything that's water repellent. And they're a byproduct. And for years, no one knew what these things were, how dangerous they were. But we realized the only way to break them down is to heat the water up to some extreme. They've got to be heated up to some extreme temperature to break them down. Right. If you just dump them in the water, they stay. Mm. Right, so they're they're bad and they can cause cancer. The the results of the science behind do we it is know terrible. they cause cancer or there, it seems to be the case? Depends that on who you ask. Okay, right, there are science. So there's and obviously we're just beginning to understand. I think so. The, yeah. the problem, right? I mean, you look at what happened in Lansing, Michigan, where they couldn't drink the water. Part of that was PFAS that was yeah. dumped in there. Oh, okay. But it was such high concentrations. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there were federal standards around what the levels should be. Um, it's sort of disheartening that. The EPA just rolled back some wetlands and river and stream protections to open up to allow companies to dump more pollution into the rivers. Right. They want to have the states be responsible for doing that. Hmm. And in my opinion, it's more loosening regulations on businesses because businesses have to spend money to do things in an environmentally conscious way. Sure. So, and then there, there's other issues too, like these microplastics. The microplastics. Microplastics and, and macroplastics. Is that all of that? Yeah. Okay. So, what are microplastics? I hear about this sometimes. And and uh, yeah. So, if you look is, at yourself, is my toothpaste causing a problem for the? <laughs> and it could be right. So, okay. things that come from toothpaste. 
um, hand soap. So if you look in your hand soaps, they have little teeny beads in there that help abrasion to wash your hands. Yeah. Which are banned in, in many countries they now. Are, at least right. They're banned in Europe right now, but still legal in they're the still, U.S.? Yeah. Okay. And so they end up in the water. Okay. And those, you know, think of a small fish eat those and the big fish eats that and it just contaminates the whole and this can chain. this can uh, change their reproductive cycle it can cause mm. all sorts of problems that you wouldn't expect right exactly this is the issue that is. and then what are you what are you supposed to do about this other than okay so say there's the the will and we decide we're going to ban these things we're just going to go back to the regular old toothpaste <laughs> uh and every, everyone kind of gets but then what do you do because there's if these forever chemicals are still in the water. Yeah, I don't is there think... anything that can be done to clean up? That's or a good we, question. I don't. Are know. we doomed on that <laughs> aspect? Yeah, I don't think we're doomed. I think over time, you know, it, they do break down, but it's years and years and years and right. years. Um, but I don't know. That's a good question. We're actually going to be talking about this at our conference, on, and we know we'll talk about this yeah, in a bit sure. on Friday. Okay. Um, well, well, tell us tell us about the conference. So we have a state of the waters. Um, it's an annual conference that we host that talks about issues with the river. Hmm. Last year we focused on really the CSO issue. It was really coming to light. This year we're focused on other pollutants in the river, and you've mentioned them, right? The microplastics, the chemicals. There's physical stuff that goes into the river too. People dump tires, bicycles, mm. cars, couches, you name it, it's pulled out of the river. Right. Um, there's another group called the Clean River Project in Rocky Morrison who's doing a great job of mm. pulling the physical things out of the river and putting booms up to stop needles from floating down river and you know, large trees and everything else you can imagine that's in the river, Yeah. right? Um, yeah, this was the because I, w- I went with the Voyagers on the the kayaking trip. And we could talk a little bit about that yeah. uh, last year in August, and that was the thing that every b- before we got to the PFAS and before these CSOs it, it sort of ignited this controversy. Initially, it was oh, be careful stepping in the water because you're going to be yeah. stepping on hypodermic needles, yeah. and and there was I, I mean, my wife was terrified because of that. Yeah, we weren't even thinking about. Well, you don't you think know, about it, right? Based. But if you look at the communities along the river, there's a bunch of homeless encampments that, and there's a high use of opioids. And there's the free needle program, which is controversial, whether that's good or not or whatever. But regardless, the outcome of them using needles, they don't discard them properly, right? They're getting high, they're doing their thing, and the needles are discarded along the river. Rainstorm comes along, where do they get washed? Right into the river. And then they float down. And yeah. they can land anywhere. Right. Anywhere from where they're put in all the way out to Plum Island in the ocean. Sure. I've seen them on Plum Island in, in the seaweed line yeah. at high tide. Oh, you were you were taking pictures of, of. I mean, one of the things you did on the, and for people who don't know, there was a, this, this trip, uh, the Voyagers, and they were local leaders such mm-hmm. as yourself who went out and did a tri- uh, kayaking trip of the entire Merrimack River, and you were there with your camera documenting a lot of it, and you were doing some yeah. kind of video. And I noticed when you the time when I spent, you were taking pictures of the the trash. You were actually trying to document the environmental impact. Were you surprised by anything you saw? No, because I'm so in tune to it, but I think most, I think people would be surprised in two aspects of the, of what I saw on the trip. I think one is the amount of trash that we saw. We're in, we're in a pristine part of New Hampshire away from anything. And we're floating along in this beautifully clean water at the upper ends of the Merrimack and you see tires, yeah, right? right? And the fish are all within the tires. Why are the tires stuff. there? I have no, I think people just found it a convenient way to dump them, mm-hmm. right? Just get rid of them in the, in the river. I'd heard there was, there was some kind of law in the 1970s where it became harder to, Dispose of your tires, that's correct. so it became right. like the you weren't allowed to burn them anymore. Right? Yeah, As a, right. The, so like, no, we can't burn them. Dump them in the river. No yeah. one will know. They'll, they'll sink and sure. Never so, so people were uh, surprised at the trash. I think surprised at that. I think on the opposite end, people were surprised at the natural beauty of oh, the yeah. river. I mean, there was the part you were on, right? The upper parts. We had great heron, great blue heron, bald eagles, osprey. Um, there were otters along the side of the I river. I was so, amazed. Yeah. I was amazed. I didn't realize. I mean, I know there are bald eagles out there, but to me, they're almost mythic. They're <laughs> right? like unicorns. Yes, I've seen them, and maybe I'll see like a, a young one when I get a new report, and someone points it out, and I right. have to squint my eyes. I did not realize these things would be soaring out of the sunlit clouds <laughs> right. above our heads as though they were watching us. Yeah, it looked like at one point we thought they were following us because we kept seeing over and over we'd see these yeah. bald eagles, and it was either... They're following us, or we're just seeing multiple pairs along the way. Right. It, it felt to me like Jurassic Park. <laughs> right? Like there were certain moments where it was like, I have gone back in time yeah. to another world up in New Hampshire. On well, the I th- river. And I think there's a culture around the river that historically it was a river where you dumped waste, right? Hmm. The Industrial Revolution came along. There were times when the river was yellow, it was red, depending on the dyes and the chemicals put in. And it was really looked as a conveyance for getting rid of waste, whether it was sewage, chemicals, physical materials. And so we have this history of the river not being really accessible. A river of this size and magnitude and the beauty along it, in any other area, you would hope that it's seen as a place to go fishing and tubing and really to be used as a natural resource. And I think we'd love to change that culture, Mm. 
but cleaning the river up goes hand in hand with being able to get people to access it. And yeah. So. So there are these long-term issues yeah. that you have to deal with, and then there's the kind of shorter term. Your organization is specifically targeting PFAS and things like that yeah. in 2020. What else are people going to expect to hear at the conference? So this is this Friday, and it's like nine to two. Is it, it goes eight to two? It's at eight the two. Uh, Northern Essex Community College in Haverhill, the in Haverhill, Haverhill campus. Yeah, there's 150 slots, and I think we're at 148 people. So, okay. Well, so, so if you so can't go to <laughs> Merrimack, Merrimack.org, Merrimack.org, and register if there's space open. Um, for those who can't make it, or if it's sold out at that point. We are going to be posting um, videos of it on our website throughout the next week. How much does it cost to sign up? So it's thirty-five dollars for non-members. Members were free, but a membership is forty dollars. Okay. So, so my get suggestion: the, get, get the membership, membership right? right. The, then you get the other advantages of the the membership of the council. Why would someone get a membership who wasn't a, a kayaker? Are there people involved who weren't just boaters, who aren't just in kind of the Newburyport area? Yeah, they care about the health and the economic development. You think about the cities along the river, right? There is a huge opportunity in Haverhill, in Lawrence, in Lowell. I mean, think about breweries along the river and restaurants. How cool would it be to have more of an outdoor presence and deck along the river? But if you get 20 million gallons of sewage being dumped and you're sitting out there having a nice dinner and a glass of wine, and all of a sudden it starts smelling, you don't want that. So I think those issues, the more people that get involved, become aware and become advocates for the river, the more we're gonna be able to do, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen a huge growth in the interest in the Watershed Council, but also just in the general area of the river, yeah. which is nice to see. I remember when I was sort of researching this, there were, there were people who were saying there might be some really neat things happening in the future with the sort of restaurant, dining, entertainment aspects of the river, even to this, it almost sounds like science fiction, but this idea, instead of taking your Uber home, you can get on a boat, yeah. go on the Merrimack River, and for me, please, I, w I want the boat to be a Viking ship. <laughs> I, I want there to be fire, and I want there to be a big roast pig spinning yeah, in the yeah. middle. And we can have our torches, and we can sing songs, and we won't drink out of glass. We're going to have horns. We have to have horns. We have to have <laughs> horns. And we'll go up and down the Merrimack River. I don't even have to worry about Uber. No. Uh, and visit some places in Haverhill and visit some places in Lowell and just go up and down the river and have a great time. This can happen at some point, right? It can happen. And the river is navigable from Newburyport all the way up to the dam in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. There are some obstructions in certain ports of the river, points of the river. One of our newest board members, Dugan Sherwood, who's the head of the chamber in Haverhill, actually went diving. I think you guys covered it, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. Was that a month ago? Yeah. A month and a half ago? Uh, yeah. It was like eight degrees. A very cold day. Blowing hard. The tide was ripping, and they went into the river to try to find out what are these things we're seeing on sonar radar that are potential hazards for boaters coming up. Because he wants to see that economic development along the river in Haverhill. Mm. And if you can get boat traffic to navigate the river and be able to dock, get out of your boat, have a nice meal, then go back home at sunset. Yeah. How awesome would that be? Yeah. Right? Great. They're starting a new kayak program up in Haverhill now, okay. too. So Plum Island Kayak is now going to be having kayaks for rent in Haverhill. Oh, excellent. So, Wait, do you know when that starts? Do you know anything summer. about it? Okay. Yeah, this so, summer. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So that's cool. great. I mean, getting more people on the river and seeing the beauty of it. But it's also, I want them to see the issues that happen, right? Get out there and enjoy it. But what if there's a day you can't go because there was a, a CSO hmm. or you see needles floating in the river? Well, you're sure going to make us think about it, right? You would hope that someone's going to say, Let's get this fixed. Get mad about it. Yeah. And that, that's an important piece of raising awareness. I think that's why this flag program is so important. Because you have people on the waterfront in Newburyport, the flag's up. What does that mean? There's sewage in a river. Right. Really? That's ridiculous. And then it just raises awareness and, and passion about mm -hmm. the issue. Yeah, I think about the tourists that come, mm -hmm. right? Most people locally, I think, are getting to be aware. They know it. Oh, yeah. But tourists come. We don't want to impact the tourist dollars, but you also want them to know this is an issue, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So who uh, who's going to be speaking? What are we going to be hearing about at the conference on Friday? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few people. We've got, so Heather McMahon, who heads Groundwork Lawrence, she'll be talking. Also a, a Voyager. Also, she was also a Voyager. Voyager. Another Voyager, Senator DiZoglio, will be speaking mm -hmm. about the initiatives that she's undertaken. I believe um, Congresswoman Trahan will be there, and she'll talk a bit about her her initiatives at the, at the national level. And then we've got Greg Coyle, who um, is a manager or director, I can't remember his exact title, but at the Lowell Wastewater Treatment Plant. He'll be talking about the initiatives they've got going on. And then we've got a couple scientists and professors talking about the challenges around the chemicals and the microplastics and that. So they're going to discuss the so it's going to be a nice, it sounds like a nice mix, because you have politicians dealing with policy. You That's have right. sort of people dealing with the, the scientists, wastewater treatment, all these kind of different things. Yeah, and, and, and so... Is there a th the, and the theme is? The theme is... It's identifying the problems, but then solutions. 
Okay. So it's problems and the solutions to them. I think too many times you get a large group together like this and you talk about all the problems. Okay, that's great, but what are we gonna do to fix it? So the morning session is all around identifying the problems, educating the audience about that. The afternoon session is networking with experts who are gonna talk about the solutions and what people are working on. Okay, so we're excited. and you're gonna be speaking as well. I'm opening it, kicking it off, and then I'm closing it. So I get the, the, the easy part. Okay. And, and I think you, you and maybe I jumped on your, your answer here, but if you can't make it, this thing so, sells out. How are people going to still benefit from this? Is it going to be, is the information accessible anywhere? Yeah, it'll be in two places. It'll be on our website, but also our Facebook page. Okay. So what we're planning on doing is taping segments of it at a time and releasing, right, the opening, the kickoff, and then we'll post the first opening session, et cetera. Mm. Uh, so to people who want to do something, they're hearing this and they're saying, I want to get involved and do a little bit to maybe help. So you join the Watershed Council. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they can't make it this Friday. What do you do? Yeah, sign up Sign up for volunteering. We do cleanups up and down the river throughout the summer and spring. We clean it. We own a nature preserve. It's actually a, um, a bird sanctuary in Andover. We have people that go clean what, that What's up. it called and where is it? Do you know? Oh, uh, it's it borders Lawrence. You're going to put me on the spot with the name okay. of it. I don't know what we call it. There is a name for it, though. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> I should know, right? Um, but we also clean up local parks all the way up and down from Manchester, Nashua, all the way down to Plum Island, where yeah. we'll do a Saturday cleanup, a plogging, if you will. Yep. Are you familiar with that term, plogging? No. Nope. So plogging, it came from the either Sweden, Norway, Finland over there, but it was running and picking up trash at the same okay. time. So there was a big effort in Newburyport where people go out and exercise, but they also pick up trash. Oh, very good. It was cool. actually a Newbury plogging group. So we're going to plog. We're okay. going to get people out there and pick up trash, clean up tires. Um, that's a big one. Uh, we're probably going to do more kayak trips this summer, probably some bird stuff, some wildlife. John McCone, on a regular basis, speaks about the walking trails along the river. Mm. So there's a huge resource where you can get involved and lead some of those groups. We'd love volunteers, uh, teachers, get involved and bring your classes out. Yeah, excellent. So there there you have it, if you want to get involved and not just uh, complain on Facebook, <laughs> right. things to do. Yeah. And you do fundraising, things like that. I know you did something. I live in Chelmsford and you did something in, in Chelmsford where there was a fundraising event at the um, Center for the Arts uh, right. last year that was really fantastic. Yep. So. And we have a we have a concert that's going to benefit the river um, and the Watershed Council coming up in April. I believe it's the 24th, but the okay. details will be on our Facebook page and website. But it's a concert that's going to be in conjunction with our annual meeting. Mm. And it's going to be a lot of local bands who care about the river. Yeah. And all the proceeds will go to the Watershed Council. Excellent. Yeah, Very cool. great. Very cool. All right. So uh, at, there's a part of the show where we do something called Little Bits. And Little Bits in the magazine, in Merrimack Valley Magazine, is just kind of little short stories and facts and history about um, about the region we live in and love. Um, it, this time I actually pulled little bits from the Voyagers article because your organization mm -hmm. sent me some facts about the Merrimack River. So I was going to share some interesting trivia about uh, the Merrimack River, and you can jump in on this if sure. there's anything worth, um, worth noting. The Merrimack River watershed covers over 5,000 square miles. One million people live in the watershed. It's the fourth largest river base in New England. It's tidal from Haverhill to the mouth of the river in Newburyport. Uh, there were at least four Native American sites dating from 8,000 to 350 years ago, one of which is on the National Register of Historic Places. You know, this is, do you know anything about this, to uh, the sort of Native American history aspect? Not of as river? much as I should. I, uh, there's a great, I, I think it's called Bend in the River. It's a great history of the Merrimack River. It's short. And I think the guy who wrote it was like a UML professor. Oh, really? Uh, but like sort of local historian. But what was happening is as he was writing this, uh, there was building on the banks of the river that was wiping out some of these architectural sites. So we lost a lot of the great stuff. That's sad. Unfortunately. So like, if you think of what we know, it's just a tiny, tiny bit of, of the sort of prehistory mm -hmm. of the Merrimack River, which I sort of find fascinating. And, and we're just limited into what we know about yeah. that. Uh, occasionally, you get a sense in your imagination of, of what that's been like. Because it's... It, 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 uh, it was being used for a lot of the things it's being used for now, right? Long before Europeans, right? Fishing, came here. hunting, moving logs down the river, absolutely. Sailing, recreation. I heard. I think I read something where they, local fishermen dredging scallops off Plum Island, just pulled up a woolly mammoth 
part of a jaw with some teeth in it wow. within the last week or so. So, I mean, how cool is that to think that? I, I want it for my office. I, see if, I want see it too. It'll sell. <laughs> really? I think it'll be the coolest paperweight ever is the one. I'll talk Merrimack. to Glenn. Maybe he can fund it for the Merrimack <laughs> we, 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 Valley we, Magazine. We will ask. <laughs> he might go for it. He might go for it. It's the second largest, and this is a big one. This is something that caused people to. It's the second largest drinking water source in Massachusetts. And this frightens people because they hear about these needles and they hear about PFAS and things like that. And yeah. they realize they're. They're drinking the water. Is are they overreacting? It's clean, right? So the water is processed, it's filtered, it's treated, it's all of that. But I don't think most people know, a, that it is the largest behind the quabbin, which mm -hmm. is a very clean, pristine water source that's protected. Two, I don't think people in a lot of the towns along the river realize their water comes from there, right? Andover gets their drinking water. They, I think most people in Andover think, oh, we get it from Haggett's Pond. That's great. Well, as Andover has grown, Haggett's Pond doesn't have enough water to provide water just from the pond. So it's pumped from the Merrimack River mm -hmm. into the pond and then into people's homes. It's treated, of course, before that. So I don't think a lot of people in Andover realize that's where their drinking water comes from. Right. Now, Andover it's safe. People. Of course, it's <laughs> yeah. safe. It's tested and all that. But sure. if, I'm a, if I'm someone in a community where that water is coming from, I don't want to be drinking water where stuff is being dumped into it. Right. And the for forever chemicals, the PFAS, they don't get filtered out. Mm -hmm. They don't get taken out during all the treatment. That's still in there when you drink the water. Right. Okay, good to know. And uh, one of the last things, this actually ties back with the photography, it's one of the three most important large rivers on the East Coast for its conservation value to migratory river herring and one of the six most important for 12 migratory fish species. It also supports at least 75 state and federally listed endangered species, numerous pairs of bald eagles, maybe even more than that, right? Mm -hmm. The largest tidal marsh habitat in New England and a portion of the Atlantic flyway bird migration route, which is part of the reason why you're able to have this That's fantastic right. hobby that we've we've introduced people to. Exactly. So anyways, thank you so much. I hope things go really well. Thank you. Uh, and once again, it's merrimack.org. Correct. Is, is it, and you also go look for the, uh, the Watershed Council Facebook page. You can find out more information there. Get in touch. Uh, next week, we're going to have a really cool guest on the show. This is really neat and something a little different because he's going to be calling in from from Europe. He's going to be calling in from Denmark. It's a guy named Jamie Barard. He went to Central Catholic in Lawrence. He grew up in Methuen, and he's a senior Lego designer in Denmark, and he's going to be a judge on a new show on Fox that starts next Wednesday called Lego Masters. So, so if you cool. don't know anything about <laughs> Lego Masters, you've got to check it out. There's a really, really interesting guy, and we're super lucky that he's going to come on and speak with us. Thank you so much. Will you come on okay. again sometime? I would love to. Okay. Thank you so much. Right I appreciate right. you having me. Thank you.